As you see, the title of the presentation is Balkan Travelogue Stereotypes and Archetypes. And thinking about the organization of the talk, I have listed a number of questions. And fairly speaking, I already know the answer, or I have a very good idea about the answer to all these questions. But I think that in a Rortian way, the point is in the discussion and on, um, you know, coming face to face with our thoughts, prejudices, stereotypes, comparisons, and so on, it's more important than to find some definite answers to any of the questions I might have asked at the beginning. So the questions are, what are the genres that proliferate the stereotypes? As you can see, the title of the presentation is Balkan Travelogue. In film genre terms, we are going to talk about, among other things, about the road movies. So you can consider the road movie as the cinematic equivalent of the old-fashioned travelogue from the 18th or 19th centuries, when the Balkans were flooded with the Western European travelers. Second question is the relation between insider and outsider as the bearer of the gaze between big and small other. And this is very important to all of you who are dealing with the intercultural inter mediation or education and the intercultural mediation or in the multi-ethnic uh, environments. Then we are going to talk about the different, different diverse stereotypes of the Balkans and of the Balkanites. When I say Balkanites, I refer to the imagined essential core identity of the Balkans as the region, as the supranational term and notion. So Balkan as is supranational identity of the whole region that we deconstruct and reconstruct through our analysis of the film texts. Then we are going also to deal with the cinematic reflection of the stereotypes and archetypes. Why I'm using both things, stereotypes and archetypes? Very, very simple. I'm dealing with the Balkan as, as a source of the perennial identity. So if we're talking about something perennial, we have to talk in terms of the archetypes, not only stereotypes, but also this involves recurring motives of kafana, wedding, music. Um, one of you said that, that uh, is particularly interested in the Balkan cinema and the Turkish cinema. And also we're going to talk about Fatih Akin and his films and the way he uses music in his films. And finally, this uh, talk should bring us to the answer about the, to the identification, recognition of the overall tendencies in the representation of the Balkans. And I dare to name these confronting and controversial tendencies as self adulticization and pro-European normalization. And I hopefully will be able to argue all of these things. Also, uh, before talking about the actual case studies, uh, as the intro to our talk about the stereotypes, I'm going to show you a short clip from the film I have already sent. This is among the clips I have sent to you. Have you managed at all to see the clips? <laughs> Thank you. 
probably have concluded them yourselves. Uh, a Christian Orthodox priest in question, he is a violent anti-Semitic and anti-Romani in his attitude. And we are talking about the Balkans, the mid 19th century, and the way we feel sort of denigrated, we feel as victimized and martyred by the number of stereotypes generated in Europe against and apropos Balkans, as you can see, the Balkans themselves are nesting a number of prejudices about big Europe, about the nations and their purpose. And frankly speaking, the purpose of the nation is far from flattering in most of the cases. Um, the case study I have chosen for this talk are four films ranging from 1998. That means just the very end of the deconstruction of former Yugoslavia, the breakup of former Yugoslavia, till 2016, uh, meaning four years ago. That's the last uh, case study we just seen a clip from. The four films are Balkan is a third, and they are respectively from, mo from many of the Balkan, from diverse Balkan countries. I was not able to include a film from each of the Balkan countries, but I have chosen some of the most represent representative or most paradigmatic. So Balkan is a third is from Greece, Dust is from Macedonia, uh, should I say North Macedonia? Uh, it's Ilcha Monchevsky, who else? Then we have a film from Serbia, Practical Guide to Belgrade with Singing and Crying. And then we have Aterim uh, from Romania. And traversing all these films with a short theoretical framework, we are going to talk about the stereotypes and the storytelling about the Balkans in terms of monocultural as well as intercultural thematization. So, uh, what we have, the, the first question we, are, we ask is about the genres that proliferate the stereotypes. One of the, in general, road movie narrativizes real and imagining journeys across the Balkans with inevitable and logical various border crossings. The borders they cross might be space, spatial and geographical, like in the films Balkan is a third, in July, Journey to the Sun. Those who, uh, for the one who is interested in Turkish, Cinema, it's a really masterpiece directed by one of the rare female directors in Turkey, Yasin Ustaglu. Then we have crossing of the temporal borders, like here underground or in the dust. Sometimes we have crossing of both kinds of borders in space and in time, like in Ulysses Gaze by uh, Sia Anglopoulos. And sometimes we have a quite or more abstract borders, we are crossing, the narratives are crossing, are going across the borders between various classes, ethnicities, and social groups, like between urban and rural and premeditated murder, between ethnicities, like in the diaspora stories, escape, head on, again, Fadi Hakim and Turkish cinema, or here and there, and so on. Then we have migration stories, uh, where we're having crossing the borders between diverse ethnicities, but also across continents, across social classes, and so on, like uh, Loving Glances or contemporary migration films like um, In Spite of the Fog uh, by Goran Paskanjevic. And most importantly, we can uh, say that all of these films are trespassing uh, cultural and civilization, civilizational borders between East and West, Balkans, Europe, Western Balkans, EU. Why I'm emphasizing this last point? Because the Western Balkans are the only non-EU members uh, still existing in Europe, so to say. And of course, bearing in mind this, we can also add to our uh, uh, list of the case studies, we can add more recent films like Balkans Commedia or Yours Me Better. Perhaps you have seen these last and uh, newest additions to the list. And this reminds me, I would like to ask you for a short, uh, for a very, I would say, for a very small favor in order to enliven this talk, not to be my monologue. I will ask you to prepare for the QA part of this talk. Uh, one or two titles you would like to add to this list. One or two titles of the films that might be good examples, good new examples for the talk about storytelling and the stereotypes and imagining the Balkans through the storytelling. So, the complex structure and intricate meta trajectories of the road movies obviously allow the inscription of a number of metaphorical or symbolical meanings about the Balkans, meanings the inscription of the stereotypes and archetypes. Journey as a modernist trope references coming of age stories, big mythical adventures, 
Frontier Adventure Identity Quest, as well as the search for the Christian point of view, lost innocence or preserved paradise on the fringes of the civilized world. Among dominantly negative stereotypes about the Balkans, however, we have one positive and still persisting. The Balkans as the fringe of Europe, as the, fringe, as the limit of the civilized world, are the last resort of the primordial society, romantic society, paradis perdu, a lost paradise, time of primal innocence, where the borders between I want and I can simply collapse. Because in the Balkans, you can come true whatever you want. Uh, your wishes are equal to your possibilities. So the journeys shape the meaning of Balkan identity or Balkanized as its core. Balkanized is national, cultural, regional identity nucleus is negotiated obviously among the stereotypes, gender, religion, or class stereotypes. Different ethnicities between the past and the present, Balkan and Europe, official and mythical history. Because all of these films, and that's especially important for Tu Ivana, if I remember quite well, for dealing with history, these films rely primarily on the mythical history and not on the official real history that we teach at the schools or at the universities. The travelers are bearer or subject of the formative gaze of the other, who explores and discovers the small other. In film theory, and I believe those of you who are dealing with psychology are familiar with the concept, but basically in film theory, identity formation is explained by general schemata based upon Jacques Lacan's theories of mirror stage, and scopic, meaning Freudian, endless interplay of gazes. In fact, identity is discovered only in relation with the other. So we don't have a positive definition of our identity. It is not simple to say, I am who I am. Rather, I am who, who you are not. So the definition is always negative. And for having the negative definition of your own identity, you have, you have to have the other. So you can say, I am who she or he is not. So in that term, you need the other. And that in relation, in that relation, process of othering, you can play the role of the big or of the small other, as we're going to explain in a couple of moments. So the process of othering works through the gaze exchange between us and the other, small or big other, that is between the subject and the object of the gaze. The constitutive gaze is one ascribed to the traveler visitor who is the big other subject of the gaze and he is the norm in relation to which every object small other exposed to the scrutinizing gaze is misrecognized so coming to the balkans a foreigner he looks around in fact he gazes around what's the difference between the gaze and the look gaze is a very persistent uh, i would say intruding and invading aggressive look I'm persistent, I'm staring at you, so you're exposed to my gaze. So the foreigner is gazing around, and as the big other, as the subject or bearer of the gaze, he defines us as the small other. So we are inferior to him, and he misrecognizes what he is not, so that he can be what he or she is. So we are the opposite of him, of him something that he would not like to be, so he can be defined in the negative terms as the contrast to us. So if we are small other, then we must be the big other. So, but the othering is not so simple. It always it also involves both parties, as confirmed by the gradual change of the stereotyper, meaning the big other, the bearer of the gaze, is the one who creates stereotypes. He is the stereotyper. And through creating stereotypes, he also changes him or herself. So the process of othering also tells us more about the stereotyper or tell us as much about the stereotyper as much as it tells us about the stereotypes of those who are being exposed to the process of stereotyping. So this stereotyper changes. How does he or she change? Because usually he finds a new meaning of life. He, is, he or she is reborn. He goes through catharsis when confronted with the suffering of the local population in the war-torn, ruined, or simply impoverished country. And Balkans are usually very poor, very war torn, and worry and very underdeveloped. So, helping them, he or she recognizes or re recognizes own identity. 
And this recognition in the process of the othering and in the process of the change of the stereotype, where we have the shift of the ingrained stereotypes. So in this talk, we are going to explore the gradual de- and reconstruction of the ingrained stereotypes. And in the process of othering, we can also uh, ask a very legitimate question. Since they are making the stereotypes, is there any chance that we can change the stereotypes? Yes, of course, because the othering does not go simply between the big other, newcomer to the Balkans, it also goes between and among the Balkan nations. And that process, when the Balkan nations want to position themselves as the big other, it can be realized only if the Balkan nations as big other find a new small other. And that search for the new small other in relation to which we can define themselves ourselves as big other is called by the term of Milica Batic Haydn nesting the orientalism meaning displacing the small other to find it usually in the geographical places towards south and towards east for you to understand uh, serbian language we have a proverb što južnije to tužnije further we go down the south the sadder or uh, more more unfortunate things and scenes we come upon so the, the Balkans as big other are looking for the small other towards the south and towards the east and then we come in fact we follow the trail of the political neuro neurological places because we go where we go going south from the Balkans or going east from the Balkans we go toward Middle East and there are endless conflicts between Arab Jewish and Christian population or we go toward under Caucasian, Caucasian Republic, Tajikistan, uh, Azerbaijan, and so on. And all these are the new places of new conflict in the world. And we don't even have to go that far away because as you will see from the film, and that's the part of the self exoticization stories, Balkans as big other find a small other in their local Roma population. As you have seen, uh, when the whole diatribe of the Orthodox priest is initiated uh, by the talk about the local, the local gypsy, or as, as he called them, crowd population in Romania. So, depending on whether the traveler is a native or a foreigner to the region, we can apply metaphor distinction of two types of the thematization of the nation, region, and cinema and consequentially of the national and regional identity. The explicit thematization of the nation tends to involve one of two, one of two approaches, monocultural hypersaturation and intercultural contrast. The thematization of a nation, particularly in the case of hypersaturation, tends to promote opacity in international context. For local, topical and nation-specific thematic elements are likely to be only partially comprehensive in other national contexts. The risk of opacity that accompanies topical of thematizations of specific nations in international contexts can, however, be somewhat mitigated by the more inclusive intercultural approach, which is by far the most common incarnation of the theme of the nation. So basically, we have a monocultural hypersaturation when we have a man or a woman from the region traveling in the region. So he talks in local jargon. He he talks in local idioms and that's perfectly understandable only for the local audience however if we want our story to reach a wider international audience we usually imply the other tactic employ the other tactique, tactique and that's the intercultural thematization intercultural thematization means comparison between the local and the international culture and how do we introduce the international culture by introducing the foreigner as a traveler in the region so he brings with him his point of his point of reference, and we provide the both of provide the other point of reference. And between the two points of reference, between two cultural points, civilizational points of reference, we create the intercultural contrast that is the basic for the thematization, narrative, narrativization, or representation of the region. So Monocultural perspective provides the nuanced differences and the sense of perennial skirmishes between Balkan nations. It's called internal 
othering, nesting the Orientalism, as I say. Small other wants to be big other and has to find more smaller other. In search, big other goes toward east and south, toward Middle East and Caucasian republics. The narrative about the people from the region, traveling around the region, is clearly monocultural hypersaturation we would find in the films like Balkanizateur or Aferim. It uses specifically cinematic techniques and dialogue to flag the elements that are constitutive of banal nationalism. Uh, banal nationalism is, um, is, is a very famous, I would say, um, a very famous uh, thesis of, of Michael Billig, who talks about banal nationalism. Those are the elements that express the banality of the nation, national representation. Banal nationalism can be the uh, flag that limps from the uh, from the stand above some administrative or public building. It can be a bottom, uh, banal nationalism can be the way you speak about the sport events and you play in, and you employ the rhetorics like our our great guys in red uh, t-shirts or our brave eagles who would, uh, I would know, vanquish the other side in a soccer match, or the way you talk about the weather forecast, or the way you talk about banal, uh, banal nationalism includes, you know, the trademarks of, let's say, gastronomy of every region. So banal nationalism uh, includes the way uh, we make Ivar or Lutenica or Paprikash or what, what, what else. So, on the other hand, the narrative can use contrastive cultural elements, basically like in film Belgrade Guide or The Dust, where the contrast is created between the gaze of the outsider as the bear of the normative Western standards and the wild, exotic, and the murky Balkans on the other side. So basically, when we have the travelers uh, from, the, from Europe, we have a very clear situation, and we know who the norm is and where the standards, on which side are the standards, and the who is governing the situation and branding the people in terms of stereotypes. However, the traveler from the Balkan is rather a complex figure because he or she is involved in self-definition, self-imagining, and subsequent confirmation, denial, or reversal of the stereotypes. In her seminal book, Imagining the Balkans, Maria Todorova in 1997, claims that the delayed development of the Balkans explains the Western pejorative attitude and denigrating stereotypes. Looking at the Balkans, the West sees its own past that it would like to forget. It sees the dawn of civilization or the last home of barbarism. Balkan people, on the other hand, see the same things. However, they name it different. Bar barbarians are becoming barbarian geniuses. Um, rebels and outlaws are becoming freedom fighters. Then we have uh, underdeveloped countries are becoming bucolic paradise lost, and so on and so on. We simply use the same list of the stereotypes we agree upon, but we change the value mark beforehand. So, uh, Europe sees us with a negative, with a minus before all our characteristics. On the other hand, we, we see these characteristics with a plus uh, value mark. So, that is positive for us. Those are the positive stereotypes and these are the negative stereotypes. I'm very hesitant about using the notion of positive stereotypes because stereotypes usually mean, mean something imbued with the prejudices, with sediments of prejudices, burden of prejudices and so on. But however, we can also proliferate those positive stereotypes that are part of our self-imagining and self-representation. So, um, we, uh, Balkan people, on the other hand, simply see the land where the time stands still, preserving the noble wilderness. We have the local population as the sub noble savages. These are unspoiled by the constraints of civilization. So in a clever maneuver of assimilation and perpetuation of the, of the Western-made stereotypes, Balkan films especially manage to reinvent the image of the Balkans. Usually Balkans unlike geographically parts of Europe, but conceptually are excluded from the European cultural space. But the Balkans, through the appropriated Western genres and re-evaluated mentality features, not negative but positive ones, subvert the cultural non-belonging to Europe. The Balkans now become not only the part, geographically part of Europe, but one 
perennial and eternal part of European cultural space, meaning not European, EU, period, but European cultural space, meaning the one governed by the Council of Europe and not by the EU. So the Balkans are both the winners and the losers in the game of globalization, with the stereotypes reshaped into the global imaginary. Global is a term coined by Paul Virilio, uh, and it's a neologism of global and local. And so global is the local event where the uh, global resonance, or it, it is appropriation of the global thing to the local framework. So global is something that bridges the gap between the global and local that provides the mo more comprehensive imagining that explains a lot of things. It's a way of translating Europe into the Balkans and vice versa. So uh, there are those Western-made stereotypes are reshaped into the global imaginary, exotization like a fun and wedding. No wild tribes, but proud freedom fighters. Underdeveloped jet lag jet lag rural social scape is romantic noble wilderness where the borders between I want and I can collapse in the most romantic way. We are not barbarians, rather we are barbarous geniuses. For those of you who know a bit of art history, barbarous genius is a very famous term coined by the Balkan avant-garde group Zenit, Zenit and, where the, and uh, there's a novel of, uh, written by Lubomir Mitic uh, Barbaro genius, decivilizator, meaning a man from the life of Balkan, he goes all over the Europe and he in fact ruins, destroys the European civilization. So he is that civilizator, someone who, who ruins the civilization. But ruining the civilization, in fact, he wakes up Europe as the old continent, as the old tradition and population from their uh, those from their daydreaming and he energizes Europe and Europe is now ready in, uh, in joint work with the Balkans to produce brand new art. The brand new art that would be comparable with the American art and the American art as described by Ezra Pound is the, uh, uh, Walt Whitman, sorry, not Ezra Pound, but Walt Whitman. Uh, American art is the art of the new continent, the new world and brave new people. So being said all of this, I would move to our uh, particular case studies. Is it clear or would you like to make a break and to ask some questions if I have been too fast and too furious with all of this? Or I can continue. So, Balgan is a third, it's a 1998 movie who ha that had a considerable success at the festivals, but it was shown on television, but I don't think it was uh, too commercially successful. So the subtitle is Balkan is a third uh, as one who conquers Europe from humor and melancholia in the same way. Balkan is a third is a combination of the amusing and easygoing narrative. Good photography and effective mise en scène, which in general terms bring together the diverse traditions of social drama, road movie, body body movie, and national mentality driven comedy which plays upon a wide array of Balkan stereotypes in monocultural as well as in intercultural thematization. From all these lists of genres, we have social drama, we have road movie, and then we have a body body movie, or body movie. Body movie is par excellence American genre, or variation of the genre, where the couple from the romantic comedy a guy and a girl that they come together in spite of, of the all obstacles for a rather humorous journey and they get married in the end. So love conquers all the obstacles and all the differences. Here instead of the heterosexual couple, we have usually two guys who become best friends or who confirm their friendship while the gender differences between man and woman here are inscribed in the physical and psychological differences of two men. The classical example of the body body film is Life of Weapon, 48 Hours. You can find also the elements of the body body movie in Yuzhny um, Vetter, uh, both the series and the film. And here we have a couple of friends from Greece and they embark on a journey of friendship, adventure, getting rich and so on. And thus, Balkan is a third bears 
uh, most of the characteristics of the body film or the body 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 film. So the story begins in a continental village near Edessa, near Greek Bulgarian border. And the gossip by the stories inspire a pair of friends, Yanis and Fotis, so they have very typical Greek names, to try their luck, their best bodies, turning the film into body body movie. And they embark on a journey to realize a money exchange scheme. The money exchange scheme should bring them the desired profit, but they have to go to Switzerland, so they travel via Bulgaria, Yugoslavia to Switzerland and then back home. The first part of the story that goes on in a village is worked out through the monocultural hypersaturation because we have ex insider, meaning Gastarbeiter, who comes back to the village and he has big stories about Europe, money, success, and so on. And we have uh, the little village painted with the saturated with the traditional Balkan elements. Banalities of the forsaken Balkan province, Kafana, ethno music, dusty road, poverty, stalemate atmosphere. However, there is also grain of internal othering. So it's a monocultural thematization, but with a grain of internal othering. If we take what the village near Adassa is, is it big or small other? It can only be small other because what's the big other in internal terms? It's the village in the continental Greece. On the other side, when we say Greece, we think immediately about the coast, about the islands, not about England. We think about touristic parts and then not the dusty village in some uh, obscure part far, far away from the seaside. So, in the second part, they travel through Bulgaria and the narrative develops as an intercultural contrast. So, if you accept that Greece and Greek are a big other toward the rest of the Balkans. Because the Balkans, in spite of our idea to cluster and to talk about the Balkan as, as the regional supranational identity, we have to say that the Balkans are rather heterogeneous. So we can inscribe in that heterogeneity, we can inscribe the internal othering. And who is an intercultural contrast? Intercultural contrast, then who is the foreigner to the rest of the Balkans? The only legitimate corner for the rest of the Balkans, but coming also from the Balkans can be Greek and can be Greece. Why? Because unlike other countries until recently, but unlike other countries of the Western Balkans, uh, uh, Greece is EU member from the very beginning. Uh, it's the cradle of the European civilization uh, on the barbaric fringes of Europe. So the trajectory of the civilization development of Greece can be described in a very short few words, from Plato to NATO, from ancient philosophy and philosophers to the membership in the NATO North Atlantic uh, uh, Treaty Organization. So this trajectory from Plato to NATO reinforces its superior difference vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the peninsula and especially of the, uh, of the, of the Western Balkans. So Fatis and Yanis are both Balkanizateurs and Europeans and European is a terrorist. They feel superior toward the Balkans uh, or within the Balkans. And traveling through Bulgaria, they encounter a number of things, uh, typical Balkan things, unleashed Balkan wedding in the middle of nowhere, pregnant bride, indeed indigenous lifestyles, scenes of Balkan primitivism and barbarism as the core of Balkan acts, they are, they are not so much part of. So in the under uh, in the in Bulgaria that lies behind developed Greece, Yanis and Fotis travel back in time. They come to face to face to with what Todorov suggested to be their own image from the past. But unlike Euro, unlike true Euro Europeans, they meet it with a grain of understanding, tolerance, and sympathy. They are not horrified at their image of the dawn of civilization. They tend to understand it because they are foreigners. Uh, but also they are from the Balkans, they work both ways. So, uh, Casey points, they benevolently complain about the work done by, done by Cyril and Method, Method, Methodists in Bulgaria. A case in point, Fotis asks a Bulgarian Vasily whether he is Greek. Vasily answers, ne, which means no in Bulgarian, but yes in Greek. So, 
uh, Fotis is confident that the Bolton mentality would effortlessly outsmart the normativized West as a customary resource resourcefulness triumphs over written law. So the barbaric genius would win over European or Western racism. Bolton is a third manages to bring Europe to the Balkans and not the vice versa. How does it happen if you have seen uh, the clips? Basically, you have the last clip from the Bolton is a third where our guys uh, reached the Swiss hotel. And in that Swiss hotel, they, um, they meet also a group from Europe traveling around and uh, two women from France and from Germany approach them and Fotis manages to seduce the French woman and to bring her with him back to Greece. So quite appropriately, the quest for Europe is resolved through emotions and not through political means or any other logic. It is announced from the very beginning by the cohesive gender translation of cultural contrast. Two Balkan men stand for male patriarchal principle, the twins over a female principle embodied by European women. So Balkanizator has accomplished his mission by Balkanizing Europe. The other guy, Yanis, is cautious as pro-European but Eurosceptic. He is both tolerant and respectful toward European law, simultaneously feeling that there is proverbial catch-22, loving in every rule that might, be, that might seem to favor the Balkans. He is the European as a third of the Balkans, who, real, who realizes that Balkan otherness is sufficiently Europeanized already. And through, in coming uh, finally to, to Switzerland, we have a, a clear intercultural contrast, but nevertheless, we have the change of the self balkanization of the self-imagining of the Balkan population. We're going to see that part, what happens. Can you read the subtitles? Do you understand the subtitles? I'll read Yes, yes I, I can I can understand. But most of the people don't hear the sound. I can hear the sound. I can hear the sound also. That's because of, because of that I have sent you the clips to see them beforehand, so it would be it would be easier for you to follow the whole thing. But nevertheless, I just I try to to elaborate what you have seen. Yeah. So when they come to Switzerland, the cultural contrast further develops through the appearance of other characters from the Balkans. First people Yanis and Fatis encounter in Switzerland are their regional and traditional enemies. When they hit the stopped car, it's a fat small van in the middle of in the midst of the road. At first, they think that the driver is Serb. However, it turns out to be Turk driving the van full of women and crying children. Uh, you haven't heard the sound, but the point is, while he was driving, you were seeing the rain falling through the windshield and so on, and he was listening to the traditional Turkish music. As soon as he stops the car and, and goes outside the van to take a pee, the kid 
with the second generation and obviously more acculturated and in tune with the new life in Germany or Switzerland or, where, or, or wherever they're living, he puts on, he puts in the different types and starts rapping and dancing to some sort of pattern music. Uh, what happens, as you can see, Jan is in parties, hit the stopped car and then uh, begins the quarrel, usual skirmishes, you should do stop like that in Turkey, Ankara, I don't understand where are you from, Yugoslavs, no, we are not Yugoslavs, we are Greece. And he doesn't, the Turk, the Turk guy, Turkish guy, he doesn't understand the Greece, he called it Union, Union Sun, that's, that's, uh, that's, a Greek, that's a Turkish name for Greece. And obviously you can see the lot of humor uh, in this film relies upon linguistic and language misunderstandings. In spite of being part of the same region, usually clustered together, seen as one, rather incomprehensible, not for, not not uh, not understanding, not making the difference between the Balkan people. The Balkan people themselves uh, differ hugely, and one aspect of that is expressed through the language. And usually, they cope with lots of language. They meet lots of language troubles on their way to Switzerland. So. Uh, Discovering that they are from Greece, the Turkish man is willing to help the Greeks out of solidarity as indigenous intruders in the heart of Europe. The Balkan nations outside the Balkans alter their relations, emphasizing their shared characteristics, offering the new crystallized collective self-imagining, where historical enemies, oppressors and oppressed, Turks, Greeks and Serbs get together of their own free will mistakenly and confusingly alike in the eyes of the ignorant and dis disinterested distant observers such as Europe is. So if you don't make the, any difference between us, so we'll get together because we are foreigners, we are not welcome in your country, and we'll behave in a way just you expect us to behave. So the film score, on the other hand, meticulously sustains the charm of ethnic heterogeneity of the Balkans and their changeable power relations. In Kafana, the Tianis and Fatis run together in the village. They argue whether to make it Las Vegas attraction with Western music or warm water joint with Setaki and no profit. In Bulgaria, we hear ethno music, Balkan turbo folk in its early days, gypsy music at the wedding, and finally Bulgarian versions of Western popular music from the 70s. In the Swiss hotel I've just mentioned a few moments ago, the evening begins to clean out for something stupid that is to be replaced by Buzuki and Tritaki as the romance grows stronger, converting the hotel lobby into a make-believe romantic summer in Greece. And so the Balkan deterrents finally come to Switzerland, their money scheme doesn't succeed, but nevertheless they return to Greece enriched uh, in their mutual friendship, understanding, and in their uh, really imagining and believing the Balkans as the best place to live in, in spite of everything. And so that's why I say Balkan in the third are colonizing Europe for both humor and melancholia, and they win over European restraint modes of life and so on. And they manage to convince a part of your French woman and French and German nations are the axis of the contemporary Europe in terms of power, economy, whatever you like. He uh, even manages to bring one pole of that axis to the Balkans. So that was happening in 1998. Uh, the talk about the EU was buried at its beginning, and so on and so on. And two, two years later, we come to the next film. Just to see how to, 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 to move it. Sorry. Uh, yes. It's the dust, and the talk was dust. I have entitled The Mythical of Tea. So it's not going to be a contemporary story, but rather a promotion of the mythical imagining of the Balkans, a mythical that um, mobilizes a huge, uh, huge folklore and mythical heritage of the Balkans, multicultural by default, multi religious by default, as I would say, and as you would see it in the film. Have you seen the film, by the way? Because it's one of the best films of Manchevsky, and just be, after that film, he made a huge turnover in his style and his oeuvre, and he began a line of films that are not so strictly genre-defined, that are sort of 
contemplative, from mothers, shadows to willow, and so on. Have you seen the dust, perhaps? The analysis of the film that stands as rather isolated case in Machevsky's Ur reveals it to be cultural appropriation of the Western, the one rewriting a mythical version of the Balkan history by depicting the foreigner's journey through Balkan history, past and present. Dense intertextuality, citations, allusions, etc., underlay the images of perennial Balkanness, but resonating across historical and cultural or national boundaries. It suggests that the Balkanization is well on its way and that we have a perfect case of intercultural contrast that explains the enigma of the Balkans in a very acceptable, popular, popular and well-known terms. Dust is basically just to resume two-layered narrative. One narrative line is situated in the present day in New York and the other in pastoral Macedonia at the beginning of the 20th century. In the contemporary story, a young African-American man named Edge robs an apartment in New York. Angela, the old lady, owner of the apartment, unexpectedly wakes up. But instead of calling the police, she begins to tell her life story, holding Edge at gunpoint. When she ends up in hospital, Edge keeps visiting her and the storytelling continues. Angela dies and Edge carries on telling of, uh, uh, and Edge carries on the telling of her story. Acculturated Western, Lucas Gospel and travel around Macedonia on the Ottoman Balkans began to take shape. In the wild, wild west, in the very last years of the century, two brothers, Luke and Elia, fall in love with the same woman, Lilith. Kynes, Luke runs away from the family menage at Trois and ends up in Macedonia, becoming the bounty hunter. Instead of hunting the rebels for the money, he joins the Macedonian freedom fighters against the Turks. Elia, the able-like brother, follows Luke in search of revenge. Luke dies, saving the rebels, while Elia takes the small Macedonian baby girl with him to New York. The baby is Angela, the storyteller. And beside everything else, dust is a perfect meta story, the story of the storytelling and the art of the storytelling. The entangled narrative unravels uh, as the road veers from the New York Wild West across the Atlantic to the Wild East. In temporal terms, it departs from the present, goes back to the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century to end in the realm of the circular time of myth. In terms of genre, it interbeams road movie, western, as its mutation. The West is placed in the Wild East, East Eastern, preserving the genre social task of mythologizing national history and articulating national identity, evoking at the same time the history of its cinematic imagining and performance. Basically, this, uh, the social task, the social role of the Western is to mythologize the American past, to mythologize the American history. And the, the American history is the history of conquering the Wild West, of going over the frontiers, uh, going plunging into the uh, uh, frontier adventure, and making the America a big, huge country that spans from east to the west coast. So, if the Balkan uh, version of the Western is to mythologize Balkan history, then it has to mythologize the fight against the Turkish oppressors to fight for, for the freedom and independence from the Ottoman Empire. And so, if we displace Western with that task into the East, it becomes Eastern. But thus, also, unlike other Westerns, it has at the same time its metafictional layer, meaning that it doesn't only talks about history, it also evokes the history of Western as human genre, because it, it, it cites the usual uh, representation of the duels, battles, it changes, it evokes the, uh, the transformation of the Western hero from the renegade outlaw into the someone who brings civilization, uh, peace, and order to the wild, wild east in this case. Unlike also, Unlike other variations of the Western, Eastern is not astronomically entitled. Because we have Spaghetti Western, we have Kraut Western, Paila Western, even Borscht Western. And only occasionally and rarely, but it's not institutionalized, so dust is recognized as Baklava Western. But more than Baklava Western, is, it is labeled in geographical, meaning East, Eastern terms, or period terms, as a Byzantine Western. And that, renaming according to geographical and temporal borders 
underlie the natural evolution of displacement of Jean. Already attacking on Houston, the Western moved toward Mexico, toward a new century and new things. In thus, Western and film moves toward the west and the east, into the Balkans and the height of colonization as the Jean's last frontier. The Western conquest of new territories gets new disguise as endless Balkan freedom fighting at the, at the beginning of the 20th century. The Balkan past is revised according to the command. When history becomes myth, print the myth. And that is also a citation from a very famous Baroque Western, perhaps the last of the big Westerns, the man who shot Liberty Valens. In that case, the owner of the newspaper stands when, or says the same thing, when history becomes myth, print the myth. And here, when you're coming to the Balkans, forget about the history and just deal with the myth because you're coming from the realm of Western into the realm of East, print that are equally mythical. The mythologizing perspective is assured by Luke, whose bewildered gaze finally identifies the both as skirmishes and battles in terms of Western Armageddon, fight between good and evil. The othering makes the Balkans an ennobling experience for Luke. He regains his lost idealism as he sides with the rebels and their moral imperative. Do not kill for gold, but kill for ideals. Angela proudly claims in the end, Luke never killed a man without a good reason. And so we're going to see just the very beginning uh, um, of the film uh, when Luke makes a move from the wild east to the wild west. He goes across the Atlantic Ocean and you have an homage and a paraphrase, stylistic homage to the old news reels and pay attention to whom he encounters crossing the ocean. Einstein, Freud, Picasso, all the great century, all the great figures of the European 20th century. Then how he encounters Macedonia in the real uh, news, uh, news reels, he, he watches in the cinema, and what's the label for Macedonia? And then he, when he really comes to Macedonia, how does he think about the Macedonians and the whole and everything going on in there? He thinks in a very colonial terms of a superior foreign other, in spite of he's a cowboy coming also from the wild distance. He thinks about the small, small other in very denigrating, but, uh, but generically recognizable terms. I was up in a boat in America, so I thought I'd see the listeners. And obviously the guy wrote something down and signed in as a single point. American Empire, the look of things to come. Wasn't ready for the new century. The new century wasn't ready for him. It ran him over like a miserable road kill. What did he learn from all these? He learned where the money was. 
when looking for him. Pick up his old dog, pulling the road. He packed the gospel according to Luke. Those dead men don't fight. Then moved to the last frontier, far from the wild west, the wild east. Well, the centuries don't follow one another. They, they coexist. Over 200 gangs roamed the Macedonian countryside. The gangs screwed the regular folk worse than the Sultan did. Some fought for freedom, some fought for land, some fought for God. But everybody liked gold. Everybody spoke a different language. It was like Ellis Island. Luke couldn't tell them apart, but for all he cared, they could have been Chinese. Uh, as you can see, uh, Luke was ready for the new world, a new century, but new century was not ready for Luke. And Luke goes toward the old colonial exotic, besides uh, there are all sorts of third world countries, Africa, Asia, and finally Macedonia, jewel in the crown, like India is jewel in the British crown. Uh, Macedonia is in the crown of the Ottoman Empire and he decides to follow the trail of money which is something he recognizes and this is a very fine touch when the, when Tsar shoots at the audience uh, toward camera everyone in a kafana uh, goes under the, the tables because they are so afraid they don't make any difference between the reality and what's going on on the screen there was no border, firm border between two worlds between the reality and the illusion and so the films were so popular and in a way thus also erodes and erases that border between uh, reality and illusion, mythical and official history, daydreaming and history and so on between the audience and what's going on in the screen due to its fantastic, slightly saturated visual style. So, and he says two more things. It was so, sort of uh, Alice Island, multicultural, multiculturality of the Balkans is like the melting pot of America. And for all he knew, they could have been Chinese. He doesn't discern or understand the identity of the people in front of him. And he'll come, he'll, so step by step, he'll come to the full understanding. So the story jumps back and forth between the centuries. As in the Balkans, the centuries do not follow up each other, but coexist like parallel universes. You remember perhaps the motto of the of Franceschi's previous film, Before the Rain, when the circle is never full, the circle is never perfect, the circle is never closed. Like here, it's more or less the same, well, but we have parallel universes. We are floating in the midst of time. Linear time bands and buckled into the mythical circle, endorsed by the medieval orthodox metaphysics, founded upon the revived medievalism, which combines Byzantine, orthodox, national, mythical, and biblical elements. Of course, the main characters are called Luke, Gospel according to Luke, and uh, his brother is Eliah, and we have Lilith, which is obviously biblical names. Angela is the name of the, someone to bear the news, mediator between the realms, the uh, empires, and so on. Edge is not the biblical name, but it's quite functional name. Edge is always on the edge between the two worlds, two centuries, and so on. And then we have the name of the of generic names uh, of the Macedonian Tsar, which is basically a very recognizable name everywhere, name of the rebel leader. And then we have Neda, uh, which is a typical name that can be, um, you know, Balkan name of a very fragile, uh, fragile, beautiful woman, and so on. So the decisive confrontation takes place in front of the fresco of the Judgment Day. You can see also that as a clip from the dust, which was the second clip. When an Ada takes dying Luke into her arms, the film shot paraphrases the Serbian fate in Kosovo Kadavik at the door from Kosovo. It is like Tableau Vivant from a medieval episode, considered the mythomater of the Serbian nation, from sacrificial and redemption narrative that defines the purpose of Balkan history in its eternity. Rewritten mythomater is memory narrative of the past. And prediction of the future. The Balkans rest upon metaphysics and myths, emblematic of the narcissistic self imagining and the spreading of the Balkanization, underlaid by the trope of the hidden, of the hidden gold aimed for the true believer. 
because if you fall in love with the Balkans, you'll be rewarded. The Balkans are a place where we have a lot of hidden gold and you have to work hard to find it, but everything pays in the end. Because even in this film, what does the edge, what does edge do in the end? Out of rage, completely helpless and desperate, he bangs the door of the refrigerator with his fist. At that moment, the Turkish gold coins flow out from the fridge door like a jackpot. Or a very different thing, a very different example, not from our corpus of titles. The corpus of titles is Die Hard with a Vengeance. If you remember, Bruce Willis is driving Hugo and he's going across the Brooklyn Bridge and uh, Hugo is obviously a very poor car, he's barely dragged, he cannot keep the, 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 the speed and so on, and he stops the Mercedes, takes the Take the driver out of the Mercedes and in back in at the car. And the driver of the Mercedes is left with the Yugo in midst of the broken bridge. Of course, the driver of the Mercedes is very enraged. Uh, he, he is banging the, the, the car with his, uh, with his leg and so on. And, but Bruce Willis reminds, well, he calmed down when he uh, looks at the back seat. What do we have at the back seat? We have a left golden bar bar of gold that they snatched from, from the bank or from, from whatever. So usually if you uh, fall across the Balkans, if you fall in love with the Balkans, you're rewarded with that uh, trope of hidden treasures. And these, those hidden treasures are not only gold, but are also gold. They're more, you know, spiritual values of freedom, romance, and so on. So if the Balkans are so appealing and attractive, then, then we can come to the, our next example, not running away, but rushing to the Balkans. And that is the film from Belgrade, Practical Guide to Belgrade, The Singing and Crime. After year 2000 and uh, October the Fifth Revolution, the directors of New Belgrade School, that I like to call them, that's a group of young guys who graduated from the Belgrade Czech of the Drama Arts. So we, can, so we can talk about the Czech school that graduated from Prague. Pamu, then we can talk about Bel uh, Belgrade School graduated from the Technical Drama Arts. They convey their worldviews by new formulas that widen the rather narrow genre scope of national cinema. In postmodern eclectic style of media cliche and popular cultural stereotypes, they produce a sense of yearning for and fascination with the West, but also yearning for and fascination with the Balkans. In fact, they portray Western fascination with Serbia as the limina the promised land, as well as the land we all long to get away from. We are talking about 2000 and the whole decade of the heavy migrations from former Yugoslavia, of generations of people leaving Belgrade, leaving other parts of Serbia in search of the normal life and not only economic stability. The omnibus film, Practical Guide, is directed by Bayan Bullet. It's after the script written by him and his classmate, also director Stephanie Semin. The theme of falling love in the Balkans and Belgrade emerged as they worked there together on an earlier project, but was definitely shaped in Bullet's debut film, Practical Guide. A story about foreigners who come to Belgrade. French woman, American guy, German, Turk, and Croatian man, searching for various things, work, adventure, love, sex only to find more than they, have, than they have ever bargained for. They become enchanted and seduced by the hospitality of the cosmopolitan, yet devastated Balkan city, and its inhabitants who fulfill wishes of the visitors. The locals are warm-hearted, depressed, and open-minded characters on the social margins, sympathetic and kind losers in the everlasting economic crisis and political transition. The carnivalesque transgression of Jean Borders is further underlined by Belgrade's position in the center of the Balkans as the bridge, eternal crossroads of East and West and their cultures, as the meeting point of the civilizations, the city where something is always in motion. On the top, this violent conflict of the 1990s and October the Fifth Revolution in Serbia, Serbia itself is built on the road of transition towards European Union, as well as in social transition for which we know the beginning but do not know the end. For 30 years, Serbia is living the life in transition, motion, and migration, like the rest of the Western Balkans. So the film Practical Guide begins with a promo clip about Belgrade as a city of future, and ends with a Balkan wedding between eternal frenemies, Serbian woman and Croatian man. And Croatia is at, is, is at that moment already a new member. So Belgrade becomes 
city of love between Balkans and Europe and city of love in general. Omnibus is divided into four stories, a love crisis, a golfer and wedding, about the different deep emotional, passionate and love, relation, love relations of foreign guests and Belgrade citizens. The newly employed young driver Stefan is assigned to drive Sidney, a famous friend chanteuse from the airport to the central hall, to the concert hall. Middle-aged Melita, production assistant in the concert hall, plays professional dominatrix with Brian, an American diplomat. In return, she hopes to obtain the immigration visa green card. In the hotel where they regularly meet, Yamada works as a chamber chambermaid. She falls in love with Orhan Baku Devra, a German businessman of Turkish origin. Orhan comes to Belgrade to buy a bankrupted Serbian company, but through a seduction game in an authentic Belgrade Safana with live music, he discovers his roots and falls in love with Volkan and Yavoda. In the same Safana, Yavoda's friend, the policewoman Georgia, is having a girl see as she is about to marry Croatian colleague, uh, her Croatian colleague Mato. So you're going to see that famous, uh, one of the loveliest scenes in the whole film, I would say, uh, that uh, makes a fine demarc that draws a fine demarcation line between Bert, Stevda, and Welsh Berts, and that encapsulates the whole spirit, the whole concept of the Belgrade, the city of future and city of love. And they are on purpose, uh, logically, they are talking pidgin English since uh, English is not their native language, but they cannot communicate in their, in their own native languages. She doesn't understand Turkish, she doesn't understand Serbia, so they communicate in English. Pain. What? That is pain. Pain. Pain is just pain. That is more than that. That is a, a Turkish word, or what Germans would call world pain, Welshness. Anybody? I have no doubt. I bought one of your old construction companies. My flight to Berlin in the morning was cancelled and I get a flight tomorrow. Businessman often lost in Serbia. You see, that is damage. There is something we don't know. I'm sorry to be the one to inform you that Orhan, tonight you will cheat your darling. No. Yes. Not so funny. You are funny. Now, Orhan. My German Turkish friend drink as you have never drink before. Mm -hmm. 
to sit here for the next hundred. Um, So as you see, when she says that is something more than pain, pain is simple pain, and that is something the, the pain of the world. Lautschmerz, Balkans are usually in some, in some sort of the very excited and um, hypertrophied emotional state. Kusturica uh, describing his work with his with his actors that they're usually not tortured. They say they usually have a body temperature slightly raised compared to the rest of the people. It's usually that because and because of that, people from the Balkan they suffer, they love, they are passionate more than the rest of the world. So that hyper emotionalism of the Balkan is even expressed in that term that that is Welsh, but more primordial and more closer to our roots. And so she she knows that their liaison is already doomed, it wouldn't last, and she accepts it with joy and with that depth. With, with awareness that the pain would follow, and that pain makes her uh, all seer and all control of everything. The full stories are in fact divided by, uh, and their end is marked, skip from one story to another, is marked by the music number. And so the music numbers between the stories are like in Hollywood musicals, all romantic films, but above all, ironic, like in Fatih Spot, is head on. Stewardesses, policemen, chambermaids, road workers, and prisoners sing five sad classic love songs, reminiscing in gold Belgrade once upon a time, driving metropolis on the board of the fallen empires, open toward the world and embraced by the victorious states of the Great War. However, they also echo for Belgrade as a city of future, which will be again recognized as New York of the Balkans, the city where the city that never sleeps. The diverse choirs, like theater choirs of ancient tragedy, present the characters, comment, explain. The irony is introduced through the discrepancies and gaps between the image, comments, and lyrics of the songs. On the screen, in a mockumentary style, are accidentally caught couples in love, kissing around against the cityscape devastated by NATO bombing, accompanied by the comments about the prosperous city. It's the first clip I have sent you, and these comments about the prosperous city echo very much what uh, actual vice mayor is envisioning for the city but actually doing nothing but destroying and constructing everything he can. So drinking rakia, singing love songs in out of in or out of their character, experience and express pain, misery and fleeting moments of happiness. They shed the tears of sorrow and happiness. They outline differences between Western pain and Balkan death will bring orphan back to his roots. The musical difference and deference is paradigm of the Balkans, Belgrade as a destiny and destination for the Europeans in search for paradis perdu. In the end, singing about future, camera stays within the walls of the prison Balkan, and we have both prison Balkan and fortress Europe in the world that is migrating around. And from that moment, and that film is about actually uh, the first time we don't have migrations and escapades from the Balkan, but migration and escapades to the Balkan in order, in order to have a moment of jouissance, of freedom, of love, of liberty. I don't, on purpose, I don't use the term pleasure because pleasure in Barthian terms is pleasure is something you expect. It's a culturally coded emotion. I like jouissance, which is very visceral and freedom. It's, it's freeing you, it's quite unexpected. And jouissance is something that ties more with your, with your, not emotions, but affects. It's something you can't control. So if you want to experience, to have an adventure, non-controlled, free from constraints, you indulge and you experience jouissance in the Balkans, either for love, sex, money, or whatever you like. And that was, uh, the film is made in two, 2010, and uh, it was already the moment of the huge economic crisis that shattered world, Europe, of course, and the Balkans. And so in the next period of time, uh, Balkans, uh, Balkan cinema was more oriented toward uh, co-productions, uh, either regional co-productions or European co-productions. 
So they continued that sort of the intercultural automatization. And if that intercultural automatization was not possible or logical due to the chosen narrative, in fact, they were rewriting the intercultural contrast into the monocultural automatization and displacing all that back in time. And that brings us to the last example, irony and self-irony stereotypes and prejudices in Akarim. Radu Yuda Akarim means bravo. It's a usually with a sarcastic spin that fits well with the ironic and subversive stance of this film. We can't change this world. We live as we can, not as we want. At one point, Constantine rhetorically asked if people will remember and acknowledge all the things that he and people like him did 200 years in the future. The answer is Akarim, bravo. Of course, they will understand, they will recognize the things you were doing two centuries ago. Why? Because the things are more or less staying the same in the Balkans. In the Balkans, the, the time is circular. So we just have the repetition of the stereotypes, events, archetypes, uh, history, and so on. Uh, it is like uh, one of the tropes why the Balkans are powder can, because we are moving in circle where every 50 years or so the Balkan powder tank explodes regardless of what we are doing or not doing to prevent that. So, bravo, of course, do live as you can, people will, will, will remember you in that way because they are going to live the same lives as you. A constable and his son, who serves as his deputy, search for a runaway slave who was sleeping with his master's wife. Constantine has the limp and the cough. His days as a bounty hunter are coming to an end, but he still brims with fierce authority and physical swagger. Should they mention liberty balance again? He is on the brink of coming from reality into the realms of myth. An old, experienced man who, who possesses all the wisdom in the world and who wants to give it to his son. His teen son endures his father's stones and endless words of wisdom and acts assuredly, long sword in hand, in case of threat. The two men meet a wide variety of people, including the Christian priest at the beginning, who goes off on an anti semitic tirade, Turks, Russians, Romanians, and Hungarians. They stop at the bar that is at the same time a brothel, where the young man gets his sexual initiation. He goes to bed with a prostitute, but his father pays for that experience. They travel through very much like spaghetti western bearing countryside, excellent photography as usual of Marius Fandurum, 35 millimeters wide screen, black and white photography that heightens the sense of reality and authenticity, like some ancient newsreel. It's the same thing as you have in dubs. When you have something to be very authentic, very mod retro, you, you change it to that perfectly tuned black and white photography. But also both pair of heroes and the audience have to make their way through, through and make sense of boiling myth, prejudices, and attitudes unique for the Balkans. Because uh, it is confirmed the script was written after the original historical writings, travelers, documents, tales of the time from 200 years ago. So you might wonder if we are so much relying on the stereotypes, authentic stereotypes of the period, why there is no the, the key paradigmatic figure of Romania in all folk tales in popular culture, why there is no Dracula. Yes, there is Dracula. They don't meet actual Dracula, but getting back the runaway slave to his master, the master, in fact, punishes the slave. He castrates him, which is a savagery and brutality comparable to that one of Dracula. And not to mention, since Dracula was also at the beginning of the, of, in the mid 18th century, he's dressed in the same way. So Dracula is that absent presence that is inscribed by a proxy figure in this tale. So we have the full scope of the stereotypes. Uh, what's, what's also important that this film is not only about something that has happened 200 years ago, but it's, that it is also something uh, that is about something that is going on still, still today. Its main topic, it's, it's one of the key subjects, is the one about the Roma slavery. And as a subject that is still seldom recognized, much less condemned in Romania. It continues to resonate in the second class treatment of the Roma population today, and it also resonates in the rising or eternal anti Semitism in Romania. So, the actuality of the topic is confirmed as the film is described as Django Unchained, 
the famous film of Tarantino, falls from the slave owner's perspective. But it is not only the slave owner's perspective, it is also the perspective of the very unusual slaves. On one hand, the slave owners are referring to Roma population as the crowd. Why is the crowd? Because they're black as the crows, and the crow ravens and magpies, they belong all to the same family of the birds. And the magpies are renowned because they're stealing everything. You know, they just steal every uh, glittery and shining object they can get hold of. So the gypsies are more or less running around the country, cheating and stealing whatever they can get hold of. But that's one side of the coin. These Roma population, these crowds, as they perfectly call them, they are very unusual. They are not habitual slaves. At one point, the runaway slave Karsin uh, demonstrates that he is not subhuman slave that Constantin likes to believe him to be, and he begins to tell the stories of his journeys to Paris, Vienna, and Leipzig. Leipzig. So, in the midst of the story, about internal stereotyping and perpetuating the European stereotypes about yourselves because that's the letter passé to be understood by the rest of the Europe, you insert, you accommodate the micro story about how does the periphery stereotypes the center? How does periphery see the center? Because the, that's the way Karpin uh, describes the journeys to Leipzig, Vienna, and Paris. Uh, bright, big uh, buildings, full of ornaments, wide streets, and so on. But there is something that we have here plenty. They lack something we have abundance of in the Balkans, and that's that direct human contact. We are very approachable. They cannot be approached because there's huge distance between the classes, between those wealthy and those poor, and so on and so on. And the supreme irony is that, in fact, Karpin uh, doesn't say that in the West you are not supposed to have slaves. Unlike in the Balkans, you, can have, you still can have the slaves. Because he sees the distance between the classes, distance between the classes in the West as a form of slavery. He's pretty, I would say, left oriented Marxist, uh, Marxist Roma, Roma. So, a ferry is everything. Uh, opposite of a cultural celebration of multicultural Balkans. Yuda uses startling, hilarious misanthropy to portray Eastern Europe's immoral legacy and the immoral legacy of the rest of the Europe, an ill-fated, dissolute spine culture that has bequeathed the region a cynical presence, amply supported by the Eurocentric stereotypes applied even to the second-class EU, EU members. So Romania from uh, 1835 is still Romania as today, at least it has the same problems, and that's the cynical uh, perspective we have in this region. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And that cynical perspective um, is amply supported by the Eurocentrism of the general uh, film industry. Eurocentrism meaning that you see everything from the focal point of the Western Europe, because when you say Eurocentric, it doesn't mean it's the whole of Europe. It's EU-centric perspective, in fact. And that EU-centric perspective at the periphery also sees the new members of EU that came into the second uh, round of EU membership. So the, that second class, and the second, second order EU members are still seen in the terms of the good old periphery of Europe, meaning in the terms of the good old Balkan God forsaken places. So, and now we can come back and try to answer the questions or to at least to provide some sort of uh, recap to the imaginary questions I, I uh, asked at the beginning. So, what are the genres that proliferate the stereotypes? Um, Basically, the moment of border crossing as uh, the key for the, of the road movie mark also the exchange of John and not, surprise, not surprisingly, Balkan journey narrative, narratives are found in comedies of mentality like Balkan is a tale. In Western adventure films like Dust, in historiographic metafiction, that is again Dust but also underground, in romantic comedies like Practical Guide and Balkan is a Terror. Travelogue is the modernized form of road movie, and basically, we can see that. Balkan's heterogeneity is best described in a very hybridized genre terms. 
So we are not talking about pure zones, we are talking about the dominant genetic features in the hybridized sex and the hybridized narratives of the Balkan cinema. Relation inside and outside, a big and small other, both are used, especially bearing in mind the development of the localization. And we have interweaving of monocultural hypersaturation and of the intercultural contrast to the point that within one cell you have um, interweaving of the both perspective of the both perspectives. Why? Because sometimes it's the idea that you should uh, make place, you should find a place for your film at the international market, so you're obliged to, to employ intercultural contrast. And on the other hand, sometimes, as we are talking about co-productions done uh, with Euro image, you have to conform uh, the demands, the standards, you have to meet the stereotypes of Euro image. And those are Eurocentric stereotypes about the Balkans. So it's in great, it's, uh, there is, is that, uh, I would say, inherent, I would say, intercultural contrast. It goes without the saying that you have to employ it. There were stereotypes of the Balkans and of the Balkanas. The, premi the premises delineate the two pronged analysis. Uh, the journey is the metaphorical quest for identity and the analysis of the cinematic text as the articulation of the essential feeling of Balkanas. Place of the description of the Balkan stereotypes and the, those Balkan stereotypes are usually uh, supposed to be valid for the whole Western Balkans seen from the European perspective. And from the insider's perspective, their support is sustained as a crystallized collective ima self imagining. So we try to imagine ourselves very much according to the guidelines provided by the Eurocentric imagining of the small other, of the third world, or whatever you like. Cinematic uh, uh, reflection, uh, we are um, talking. Sorry, no, I'm really sorry to interrupt you because I just want to remind you of the time we are. Uh, we started at 12, and now it's a uh, quarter to two. So we are already 15 minutes above the 19 minute session. If we can wrap up, so to see yes, there are also any questions. Okay, and great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, great. So, cinematic reflection, especially due to mythical perspective, we are obliged to talk about stereotypes and archetypes and recurring motives, Kafana, wedding music, instances of wild, as one of the Dutch anthropologists would say. And about overall tendencies, we have self exoticization as the appropriated pro European normalization. So we have the established stereotypes, Cherry Red Eurimage, and other international funds that are, that are, I would say, wrapped up, uh, translated into the exotic Neverland of the embellished imagining. So, in order of maintaining EU supr supremacy of the big other, EU has to have small other. And the Western Balkans will have to state that small other non-EU member, both in media, in both in media text and in reality. And what's the element of that self exoticization that works for the pro-European normalization? We can trace a very fine line. The key element of self exoticization is that we are seeing ourselves as the wilderness of Europe and very close to the Roma population. The very first Balkan film that, got, that was awarded the international prize at the big international festival was I Have Even Met Happy Gypsies, the theatric theory of Sasha Petrus. Then you continue that gypsy award line through Kusturica, through Goran Kaskanjevic, and you just perpetuate and promote that uh, it's self exoticization. We are, we are we're wild, we are barbarian we're we're genius, we are proud to do that. And we, we can express our wild emotions through music, singing, dancing, and I would say very, uh, we are very um, extrovert, unlike introvert Europe. That's what my idea was. So Q&A session, the floor is yours. <laughs>